listeners, attention all radio listeners to broadcast on Calling All Cars. The program will be broadcast at 9 p.m. on Monday, beginning May 1st. That's all. Rose and Quirk. Calling All Cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Imperial County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars to broadcast 281 regarding a murder. Be on the lookout for three Filipinos. These men shot and killed a man near El Centro of the state. No description of suspect. That's all. Rose and Chris. is refined so that it meets all the demands of public serving automobiles, whether it be speeding to the scene of a crime or slowly cruising a neighborhood to preserve peace. It is the money-saving gasoline of superior performance at any speed. When I point out that Rio Grande Crack powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold in any other brand, I always remind you that this great gasoline has a quicker start, appreciated by fast and slow drivers alike, that Rio Grande Crack accelerates more smoothly, provides more power and miles per gallon, regardless of the rate of speed. So, come on, join the army of motorists who are getting the most out of their cars at the least cost with police car performance Rio Grande Crack, the most highly recommended gasoline sold in the West. The facts upon which tonight's story has been based were taken from the confidential files of the office of the Sheriff of Imperial County, California. We are privileged to welcome to Calling All Cars the present sheriff of that county, Mr. Robert W. Ware. We in the Imperial Valley have a special problem in law enforcement. Geographically, we are so situated that we get more than our share of transient labor, and a large part of this labor is foreign-born or a foreign extraction. Our laws are not always so well understood by these people. And in many instances, there is a lack of respect for law and order. Irrespective of the difficulty of our task, we spare no effort to emphasize the losing nature of crime of any sort. The story we are about to hear was no exception. Though it began in Imperial County, it had ramifications throughout the western states and was finally solved in the Hawaiian Islands. How we were able to affect this solution you will hear as the program progresses. And I will be back at the end of the program to explain further how we brought home to a group of lawbreakers the lesson that crime cannot pay. A late afternoon breeze was beginning to relieve the sultriness that hung over the little town of Calipatria in Imperial County, California. Constable E.H. Bedford sat before a desk in the sheriff's substation, checking a sheaf of reports that lay face up beneath the wall calendar on which was printed the date November 19, 1932. Suddenly, Bedford became aware that he was not alone in the office and looked up to see a Mexican branch hand standing just inside the doorway, uneasily twisting his hat with nervous fingers. What's the matter, buddy? Want to see me about something? Uh, si, senora. I'm finding a man lying down in the road. I think I'd better come in and tell you. A man laying in the road? Where? Oh, two. Maybe three miles from here. It's a dirt road, not much cars. This man, I, I think he's pretty pretty sick. He might be dead. Who is he? Anyone you know? No, he's a dark man. He's what you call a Hindu. I think maybe he's dead. That's no go close enough to look good, though. Why not? Well, his life are still to make me have fear. All right. Wait a minute while I put through a phone call. Then we'll drive out and have a look at this fellow. Put me through to Sheriff George Campbell's office in El Centro, will you please, operator? Okay. See here, buddy. This better not be a cock and bull story you're telling me, because if it is, Sheriff I... County Sheriff's office. Oh, Sheriff Campbell? No, he isn't in just now. This is under Sheriff Rodney Clark. Oh, hello, Clark. This is Petford up at Calipatria. Oh, yes, that's right. There's a Mexican here in the office who has just found a man's body lying in the road near town. He says he thinks the man's a Hindu. 
I thought maybe you might want to send somebody up here or come up yourself. No? I'm picking up Deputy Sheriff Ike Holmes right away. We're driving out with this Mexican to see what we can learn. Uh, okay, Bedford. You go ahead and investigate. I'll uh, probably be up there by the time you get back. Right. All right, buddy. Let's go take a look at your dead man. Certainly a lonely enough road, Holmes. Not much more than a wagon trail. Yeah, that's what makes me think this Mexican might have really stumbled onto something. But how much farther is it, buddy? Oh, he's just a little way now. You see those bush where the road turns? Yeah. I find this man lying down in the road just around that turn. And we'll know in a minute, Pepper. Uh-huh. I'll slow down a little so we won't run over him if he's still there. Uh, this, this is the turn. Just a little bit more. There. Well, you see, he's still lying in the road. Why, George, that's right. Hey, I know this fellow. It's Sham Singh. He and another Hindu own a ranch not far from here. Looks like he's been shot. Yeah. As far as I can make out, he's still alive. Better get him to a hospital right away. Yeah. I'll give you a hand and we'll get him into the car. Okay. I'm going to stick to this man like a leech, Stepford. If he regains consciousness and we can get him to talk, he'll be able to clean up this case in no time. After getting Sam Singh to a hospital, Deputy Sheriff Ike Holmes, true to his word, remained at the wounded man's bedside until consciousness and strength returned sufficiently for the man to make a statement. You have a ranch somewhere near Calipatria, haven't you, Mr. Singh? Yes. My partner, Brown Singh, and I drove peas. Was Brown Singh with you when you were shot? Yes, he was in the car. I don't know what they have done with him. I'm afraid for him. They? Mm, uh, suppose you tell me the whole story from the beginning. Yesterday, we finished with the pea harvest, and this morning, Brown Singh and I came into town to get the money from the bank to pay off the men. Uh, what kind of labor do you hire? Filipinos. I see. Now, go on. The crew foreman at the ranch, he's a Filipino we call Pedro, knew that my partner and I were going into town and offered to give us a ride in an automobile that belonged to one of his houses. It looked good to us, and so he said yes. And then this fellow Pedro drove you into town, eh? No. He went with us. But the boy who owned the car drove. Uh, do you remember the boy's name? I think they called him Prudencio. Anyway, we got into the car and were just ready to drive away from the ranch when... Come on, Prudencio. Let's go. Don't you think we'd better wait for Leon? Leon? No, let him get to town some other You make way. a promise for him. Well, you're trying to leave without me. Hurry up, then. You keep us waiting. Where are the two Mr. Sings in the box seat? Well, I think you try to leave me behind. No, we're not trying to leave you. You get in the middle here, between me and Prudencio. Oh. Now let's go. Suitcases back there getting your way, Mr. Singh? No, not at all. We are very comfortable. Have you boys to take us into the bank? Oh, that's all right, Mr. C. We'll be back at the ranch in a few minutes. I want you to figure out how much money we owe the hand, Pedro. I'm going to pay off this afternoon. I uh, already figured it out, Mr. C. Good. I have it here in this little book. Twenty-six boys working. Each boy make one cent a pound. And they pick... One cent a pound? No one said these boys would get one cent a pound. Oh, yes. You told me I should tell the boys that they make one cent a pound. Yes, Mr. Singh. Pedro say one cent a pound. That's impossible. If I pay you so much, I make nothing. We don't know nothing about that. I think it's a price like I tell you and you pay. Not one pea rancher in the valley could pay you like that. The market price of peas is very bad this year, awful bad. Just the same. I tell my Filipino boys what they make for picking, and they're going to get it. You can't cheat us, Mr. Singh. But I didn't tell you to make any such price. Didn't I tell you, President you, that Mr. Singh say one cent a pound? Yes. That's what you tell me, too, President. Say, 
You're going past the red. Where are you taking us? We want to talk to you about what you owe us before we go back. So we take you up a little road we know, where it's quiet. You take us back to the ranch, or else you stop the car and let us out. Not until we fix this thing up, Mr. Dick. If you don't stop the car, I'll make you stop oh, it. Oh, no, you better be quiet and not try to do nothing. I'll show you that I mean what I say. Well, he could hit the dead So, so you would try that thing. You have the gun, have you shoot him? No. Open the door of the car. Throw him out of the car.
right closed in on Under Sheriff Clark and his two deputies without sight of the fugitives. Temporarily defeated, they turned back to town, taking the murder car with them, intent on returning in the early morning with horses to continue the manhunt. And then on their arrival at the Calipatria substation, an old prospector came forward to meet them. Howdy, gentlemen. They're coming to town here less than an hour ago to get some supplies, and the first thing I heard about was this here murder. Uh, yes, you don't happen to know anything about it, do you? Well, not about the murder, no. Uh, but I think I know something about where the fellers is that done it. Oh, fine. Let's have it. Where are they? Uh, I come into town uh, from the Chocolate Mountains, uh, using the old uh, Beals Well Road. Uh, just where the trail hits the range, I seen three pair of footprints. I reckon they was made by the men you're looking for. Great, Scotty. Why, it doesn't seem possible they could have gotten that far on foot, even with a five-hour start. Well, just the same. That's where I seen them prints. Looked like they might be making for Palo Verde over on the Colorado River. But you didn't see anything of the men themselves? Nope, just the tracks while I was driving along. You're absolutely sure of what you saw? Sure. I ain't so old, my eyes has gone sour on me. I know what I seen. Well, hardly anyone ever travels that road, Clark. Sixty miles long from Nyland on this edge to Palo Verde on the Arizona line, and only one water hole along the road. Then there's a mighty slim chance of they're picking up a ride, huh? Practically no chance at all. Then this is our chance, boys. We're driving into Palo Verde along the Bealswell Road tonight. I'll split the reward with you. <laughs> Leaving Holmes in charge at the substation and taking Constable Thetford in his place, under Sheriff Clark and Deputy Elliott made the journey to Palo Verde. It was midnight when they reached their destination, for they had encountered no sign of the fugitives. Meanwhile, Clark contacted the Mexican passport photographer and obtained a print of every Filipino he had photographed for passport purposes. Clark and Thetford then presented the handful of photographs to Sean Singh at the county hospital. Uh, Mr. Singh... We have reason to believe that the men who attacked you and killed your partner have their pictures among this group. Would you mind looking through them and see if you can identify any of the lot? Sure. I would know these men in an instant. There's one of them. Second three. Not this one. Not this. Not this. Ah, here's another. Let me look for more. Uh, here, here. Let me find the rest of these out for you so you can see them easier. There. There now. No. No. No, we have them all. That man is a third. You're uh, sure of these identifications, Mr. Singh? I'm positive. Well, Thetford, they all agree on the same men. Yeah. This is the one who drove. The one they call Prudencio. Uh, yes, we know. Prudencio Rondares. We found his name on the car registration. And this one is Pedro. Uh, gives his name as Gavino Manzano here, but we'll soon check up on that. He was the bad one, the one who had the gun. This other is the one they call Leon. Uh-huh. It gives his name here as Ponte Leon Rengor. Anyway, we know the men we want now, and thank you very much for your cooperation, Mr. Singh. <laughs> At once, copies of the photographs were mailed out to peace officers in California and Arizona. It was soon learned that all three men had been arrested at some previous date, and fingerprint records then followed the photograph. Meanwhile, three days of intensive search among the Filipino camps revealed no clue to the fugitives. It was at last concluded that they had been successful in eluding the cordon of officers. But several days later, a Filipino was brought into Clark's office. Here's a boy who says he's something to tell us about Gavino Monzano, Clark. Yes. Uh, what's your name, lad? Enrico Garcia, sir. All right. Uh, what is it you want to tell us? Gavino. He say his name Ramon Simon, but he Gavino. He tried to take away from me my girlfriend. Oh, when was this? Just before he shoot Mr. Singh and the other Hindu and run away. Uh, how do you know Gavino shot the Hindu? Oh, I see it in the paper. Oh. When Gavino run away, this girl go away, too. Uh, what's the girl's name? Maria Thorne. She come from Stockton, and for a while I go with her. But Gavino say he want her, and for me to keep away. Uh, do you know this girl's address in Stockton? Yes. 
pictures here on this piece of paper. Oh, fine. Oh, thanks a lot, Garcia. This might be a big help. If you catch this Gavino, you picked him good, no? Uh, you bet we will. But nearly two months went by, and the fugitives remained at large. And then police at San Jose telegraphed that Ponte owned Rengo had been seen and identified there. Instructions were wired back to arrest and hold him. And Sheriff George Camel left immediately by automobile for that city. Upon arriving, the prisoner was brought out for transfer back to El Centro. Is your man, Sheriff Campbell? Huh? Why? Well, that's not Rengor. Not Rengor? What do you mean? Just what I say. That's not the man I want. Are you sure? Positive. Here's a photograph of Rengor. Look for yourself. Why, George, I believe you're right. You'll admit there is a strong resemblance, though. Well, sure, but that doesn't help me any. Well, I'm sorry, Sheriff, particularly after your long ride up here. Oh, well, these things happen once in a while. When are you leaving to go back to El Centro? Well, might as well go right away. I think I'll drive out to the highway by way of the foreign quarter just on the slim chance of seeing the man I'm looking for. Isn't that <laughs> asking for a lot, Sheriff? <laughs> I guess maybe it is. Well, well goodbye. Goodbye, Sheriff. Sorry things worked out the way they did. Take me to San. 
San Diego after I go to a part of El Centro by walking. Then I went to Seattle by bus. Then in December, I come to Honolulu and both from Vancouver. Pretty soon, I come to Hanukkah and work in laundry. Then I am arrested. Now just why did you come to the island? Because I have brother and some cousins here. Because I want to get away from police in Imperial Valley. Mm, that's what I thought. Well, I found out that your brother and your cousins would rather not have you here. They're afraid of you. Sure, they're afraid of me. Why? I didn't find you so tough when I arrested you. No, that's because you take me by surprise, but you wait and see. Wait for what? It's too late for you to do anything now, Manzano. You think so, eh? Then listen. They'll never take me to the United States alive, do you hear? Never, never, never! Word of Monzano's arrest was sent by Martin to Sheriff Camel at El Centro, and under Sheriff Clark was detailed to take the next boat to Honolulu in order to bring back his prisoner. But before the ship was four days at sea, Monzano had broken jail during the early morning hours of February 21st under the protection of a downpour of rain and disappeared into the island's dense morass of vegetation. Sheriff Martin immediately took personal charge of the search, assisted by his chief deputy, Peter N. Pakela. Oh, it was the pounding of this confounded rain that made it possible, Peter. How could anyone hear him sawing away in this downpour? It's just one of those things, Sheriff. He's been in jail just three weeks, and under our very noses, he made a saw blade out of a flat bucket handle. Well, we've got to get him again, that's all. You bet we've got to get him again. He's only been free a little while. We throw a cord in a motorcycle policeman around Hilo, say, around... Four oh, territory, six miles square. We ought to have him, sure. Sounds like a good idea to me. All right, then give orders to have this done right away. Then have as many police as can be spared search the territory between the lines. Won't be much chance of finding tracks, so though. This, this rain will have washed them all out. I'll give orders at once, sir. Not far from Hilo was the isolated home of a Filipino. There it was found that Manzano had appeared soon after his escape and demanded food and clothing. Two motorcycle officers, Almas Costa and Cicero Bento, were therefore stationed to guard the hut in the event of the outlaws return. And then, early in the morning of the second day following Manzano's dash for freedom, these two officers were discussing the search while watching through one of its cottage windows. You suppose Manzano really will come back here? The Filipinos who live here seem to think so. They're scared to death. Yeah, I know. They have him figured out as a pretty desperate character. And when he was here before, these people gave him most of the food in the house and a really good suit of clothes. They wouldn't have done that if they hadn't been afraid of him. The boys at the jail say Manzano swore that he'd never be sent back to the state to lie. You suppose he meant the jailbreak? And that he'd kill himself. Well, I don't know. If he comes back here, he's as good as back in jail. You're right on that. I was just wondering if... Look. Over where I'm pointing. By those trees. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I see him. Manzano, all right. Naked as the day he was born. Tore his clothes off getting through that jungle, I guess. See there? He's looking around. Trying to figure out if it's safe to try for the house. Now he's coming this way. We'd better be quiet, so there's no chance of his hearing us. He stopped again. Suppose he heard us? No. He's making for the door again. Come on. Let's get out of sight and wait. We must be just outside the door now. All right, Manzano. You better surrender quietly. Oh, you, eh? Get me if you can. Yes, Hold on to me, Carlton. Yes. Let him get away. You, you think I can't get away? No, no, no you can't get, get away. away. I'm oh, let hurry. me alone. Costa, yes. hurry, put the cops let there. Let me alone. Yeah, I guess that'll hold him for a while. Yeah. Here. Throw this blanket around him. We'll take him in. All right. You open the door. Uh -huh. Well, then, let's go, Manzano. Yeah. You... Never will get me back to the jail, you. Look out. He's broken away. He's starting to run. Shoot me. Go ahead. Shoot me. I don't care. Come on, Costa. We've got to get him. There's luck. He's 
slipped and fell down. All right. Yeah, we got you, Mom. Hey, go on now. Nah, don't try that again. You, you can't hold me in jail. You can't take me back to the United States. Oh, yeah? You'll get shackles this time, so you can't possibly escape. I'll never see the United States again. Never! You're crazy, Manzano. You're looking at a part of it right now. Well, let's not stand in the rain all day. Come on, my vest pocket, Jesse James. In just a moment, Sheriff Ware will conclude our program. If something went wrong to mar your motor trip over the weekend, make certain the next one is automotively perfect. Be sure the moving parts of your motor are protected by real lube. And keep the parts moving smoothly, powerfully, and economically with real Grandi Crack. The police car performance motor fuel that is preferred by those who drive the most, who know the most about gasoline. And now, Sheriff Ware. Manzano has returned to California despite his vehement statements to the contrary. He was brought to trial and implicated by Rengor, who had been sentenced previously. Ron Darris was arrested by the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office in 1937. He and Manzano were found guilty and sentenced to study for the remainder of their lives the lesson that crime of any sort cannot pay. Thank you, Sheriff Ware. <laughs> Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all cars. The cancellation broadcast 281 regarding a murder. Suspects this case are now in custody. That's all. Road and clear. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Remember, one week from tomorrow night, Monday, May 1st at 9 o'clock, Rio Grande will present the case of the bitter wine. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.